Welcome to Buddha at the Gas Pump. My name is Rick Archer. Buddha at the Gas Pump is an ongoing series of interviews with spiritually awakening people. Um, as I always say at the beginning, there have been now over 340 of them. And if this is new to you, you can find all the past ones archived at batgap.com under the past interview section. Um, BatGap is a 501c3, which means it's a nonprofit tax exempt organization, and it um, exists solely on the basis of donations from volu voluntary donations from people who appreciate it. So if you feel like supporting it, um, please do. There's a donate button on the uh, on the website, and if you don't feel like it, enjoy it anyway. It's freely available. <clears throat> so my guest today is Chadwick Johnson, Chad for short. And um, he has a fairly long uh, bio here that he sent me, but I think I won't read the whole thing because it's better if he just tells us this stuff and uh, he'll tell this whole story in the process of this conversation. Um, he, I'll tell you a little bit, he and his wife Erica have been married for 18 years. They live in Sacramento, California with their five children. He has a bachelor's degree uh, and a law degree which he just re and he just recently passed, oh, you don't know yet if he passed the law exam. He took the, law, the bar exam, and we'll see. We're, we'll keep our fingers crossed, and we can all pray for Chad. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Hope that he passes. Please. Um, and he also works as a computer programmer for Hewlett Packard. Um, he's an adjunct professor at Sacramento City College. He teaches or conducts regular satsangs in the area, uh, has a YouTube channel with all kinds of good stuff on it, and um, used to be quite an athlete too. I mean, you actually almost made the NFL, or you got you dipped your toe into it for a little bit, right? Yeah, a very a very quick dip, <laughs> a very quick toe dip, you know. <laughs> but it was a good experience. Yeah, and you're you're a pretty good basketball player, so well-rounded individual. Thank you. I didn't know all that stuff was out there. You must have. I heard all this stuff and you talking to Jerry Katz and, you know, other other things that I listened to. You, you're uh, very thorough. Yeah. Very thorough. <laughs> well, I'm a junkie for this kind of thing. I, <laughs> I love kind of hearing people's stories and hearing what they have to say. And each week is a new adventure for me, getting to know the person. It's a great hobby. It is. It's a great hobby I have. Yeah. yeah. Um, so... I have heard you tell your story in various other interviews, and it's quite an interesting one. And, um, you know, obviously we don't have to start from infancy, but there are some key points in your whole trajectory that I think will lay a foundation for the discussion we're going to have. And okay. I, I think you know where to start. So let's go ahead and start, and we'll take it from there. Okay. Uh... Well, I think we'll, the good, best place to start is back when I was in law school. That's when I, you know, started having uh, a bunch of panic attacks. I started having pretty severe panic attacks. And, you know, once you have one, you always think you're going to have another one. So for my four years in law school, I was always thinking I was going to have a panic attack. And then uh, one day studying for my last... Because you're under finals. so much pressure, right? Well, I don't is know. Is a lot of stress or something? I don't know because I, I never, from up to that point in my life, I had never experienced panic attacks and I've had stressful situations. So it was really something that I couldn't wrap my finger around. And it got progressively more intense. You know, I would have something like, what was that? And then next thing you know, it was like full on panic attacks and uh, very sensitive, very uh, like paranoid about having another panic attack. It's just not a, it was just not a good uh, state. Right. And then, like, when I was studying for my very last set of finals, I was at Borders Bookstore, and I took a walk around to take a break um, from studying, and I saw The Power of Now. And somebody had told me about it previously, and I had put it in my phone, but, you know, I had a list of books in my phone, and I just happened to see that book. So right there in Borders, I started, um, you know, kind of reading, reading it, and, um, you know, after, you know, not too long, right there in borders, um, everything kind of just got silent. And I knew that at that point, uh, I would not be having any panic attacks anymore. You know, it was like one of those drastic shifts, yeah. you know. Nah. Yeah, you know, it's like drastic shifts are interesting. And it's almost like 
the people who have kind of reached more or less of a crisis often have the most drastic ones. And Eckhart Tolle is a case in point. I mean, he was almost suicidal, you know, and and then he had that little thought of, you know, are there two of me? If you know who, I can't live with myself anymore. Wait a minute, are there two of me? And and just that little thought triggered the shift. Exactly, and I, I and I can't tell you what exactly I read in his book. Some maybe it was that, or something happened where the book was not important. Then I could just sit and just, uh, you know, my heart was just pounding in my chest and just kind of just look around and see was what was happening. You know, it was just, I mean, you know, it's one of those things that uh, I didn't, I had never experienced or I'd never heard of happening. So, and I was, it was just a tremendous amount of peace about it. So I knew that I didn't have to worry or anything and that it was not a bad thing. And I also had like this shift. It's like this, um, I just knew that I was no longer a victim to panic attacks. It was like they became very harmless. My, my, everything about my mind movement became very, you know, secondary, I guess. Hmm. So it's not that you still had panic attacks, but they were harmless, but you actually just didn't have them, right? Is that what you're saying? Um, well, let me just say there was a honeymoon phase. Um, after I had that initial awakening and then, you know, for several weeks or months, I'm, I don't know for sure, but I was just really in, bl at, you know, in a state of, you know, like bliss. I hate to use those cliche words, but I mean, you know, that's basically what it was. And then I, I would just, every day I would walk to the river and just sit with the ducks and not meditate but just sit with the ducks and just be still mm. and just enjoy the not thinking, the lack of ambition or worrying about the future and just just kind of getting used to this and, you know, testing it too because I wasn't very, you know, kind of like, is this going to go away? Or, you know, it was just like a lot of confusion. But after a while, you know, I wouldn't say I never had another panic attack, but my, my mind did turn and attack. Um, I would say there was attempts or, you know, the onset of panic attacks where I was able to kind of see see it happen from a different perspective. So there was no panic in the attack, basically. <laughs> you know, there was no panic. Yeah, yeah. You're more detached from it or something. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And I wouldn't say bliss is a cliche. Uh, bliss is real, you know, um, and it's a real experience and it can be very profound and, and very nourishing and gratifying and, and wonderful so you know i mean it was definitely whatever it is whatever you call it it was definitely one of those uh things that made me realize right away that nothing else mattered yeah you know like really not i mean i could actually throw everything in that and say nothing else mattered and that's the only thing like that's the only thing I cared about from that point on. Not my, not my job, not my family, not my friends, not my goals, not my dreams, not my aspirations, not anything. Uh, it was just that, you know. Hmm. Did you become irresponsible or uh, kind of like detached from your family or something? I mean, did, did your family Probably. perceive a kind of like a, a negative shift in you? Oh, no, no, no. Well, you got to remember, I was in law school and working full time at the time. So they weren't really seeing a whole bunch of me anyway. Right. Yeah, yeah. And then uh, this was during finals when this happened. So I was uh, still studying for finals after this shift had already happened. So I remember sitting in the library and just sitting in the library, watching everyone walk around and stress about um, you know, the exams and even in my head thinking you should probably be studying, but then having something that was greater saying all as well so that I could that I could just rest there. I didn't have there was no uh, sense of urgency about studying or anything. You know, mm. it was just it was good. But going back to my family, um, they, they definitely saw a shift, but I think everyone on the outside was kind of probably pretty skeptical about that shift, you know, um, and, you know, I don't blame them, you know, I was just, it's a, it's, it's something I probably didn't handle. I mean, I did not handle, um, 
I didn't handle right. Looking back on it as a very immature, having a spiritual awakening, and I just was, I didn't, I didn't, my imagination uh, caused me to do things that, or uh, think that I was more than I was, you know, at the time. It was just, you know, I had some pretty, it was, it was a combination of bliss or, you know, heaven and hell, even after the spiritual awakening, you know, after that honeymoon phase. Did your uh, shift, you know, your newfound peace and tranquility actually help you get through finals better? Uh, it, you know, when I, when you say better, I would say it definitely in the, from the state of not being stressed about it at all or, um, and honestly, you know, your last year at law school, your last set of finals, you, you already kind of know the, the drill. So it's not a very stressful, uh, set of exams anyway, uh -huh. you know? So, yeah, I don't know that it helped me too much as far as academically, but as far as, uh, my stress, obviously, um, there was no stress, you know? Yeah. I bet you it happened, helped you academically too. I mean, if you're all stressed out, then you can't think clearly and. Um, you know, you're likely to not do as well. I, I mean, I'm sure. I mean, it has so many, uh, I mean, it healed. My whole life has been healed by this awakening. You know, if I don't get anything else, you know, my relationships, uh, everything, I can't even, uh, just to name one thing would be arbitrary. You know, yeah, everything sure. has, has healed as yeah. a result. And so do you define what happened to you, right? You know, when you picked up that Eckhart Tolle book as the awakening or was that just sort of the beginning of it and then there was more to unfold well uh i think uh in order to i, I mean i think yeah that that was the awakening as mm -hmm. far as i'm concerned because from that point on uh i i knew that i was not my thinking and although i fell asleep i fell asleep and i continued to fall asleep in my thinking um there was never a there's no continuity in my ego you know what i mean so when there's always these breaks in between uh you know egoic identification then it can never take hold so there was just like a underlying sense that all is well even within the drama you know mm -hmm. yeah and you never lost that that's cool yeah and it just uh clarifies itself oh, as, as i mature you know yeah so I got the sense from listening to your other recordings and interviews and things that, you know, this, this really set you off on a quest to understand what this is about. And you started devouring books and YouTube videos and all that stuff. Absolutely. I mean, uh, I was already in that study mode, you know, like reading and just going deep. And I just took, well, I actually had paid for the bar exam. And all of my classmates, while they were studying for the bar, you know, I was at the river or, uh, you know, reading uh, Eckhart Tolle or, you know, reading some type of spiritual materials. Um, I didn't really start watching the videos until a little later on. So it was mostly just reading and just, you know, just sitting with it. Course in Miracles. I've read that thick book probably 10 times. Wow over you know just you know and and not not i was reading in a way that i had never read before because mm -hmm. there was something in me that was teaching me how to read like i already knew that when you read you know i'm not reading to learn you know i just read and allow the reading to do whatever it's doing you know it was just a very i was being i was my hand was being held the whole time you know and i just trusted everything that uh everything that I found myself doing, I just trusted it. That's kind of interesting, you know. I mean, even finding the power of now was sort of like your hand was being held. And uh, it's like you're meant to see that, right? Absolutely, and, absolutely. And then I guess you're saying that even ever since then, there's a sense that the intelligence of the universe or whatever has been guiding you and prompting you to do the next, the next thing. Yeah, I mean, you know, at this point, this is, uh, what, four, uh, six years, seven years later, six or seven, I don't know. I, um, it's been a long time now, and it has, it's, a def, it's, a different, it's a different experience. It's very obvious 
to me now, you know, that this is kind of unfolding and we have a sense that time is moving forward and that we're kind of playing along. And I don't, um, in order for you to, I, and this is just the way that I see it, in order for you to ever, for the questions to ever stop or for every, to ever feel that you're done or whatever, there has to be a, a, a knowing that something else is in control and everything is just so. Hmm. Yeah. Do you feel like you're done? Uh, I mean, to I mean, the answer to all these questions are going to be yes and no, right? right. So, of course, I'm done <laughs> to a certain extent, you know. Uh, there's no more, I don't have any questions. The ego doesn't, the, the egoic identification, Chad, the, the, the role that I play is, uh, has a lot of maturing to do. Very immature. Um, my spiritual uh, knowing or understanding is more, far more advanced than my actual, you know, my conditioning, you know, and it's a beautiful uh, balance, you know, because I wouldn't have it any other way. I like the, uh, now I have embraced the part of me that is more conditioned, you know, <laughs> not embraced, but just like, you know, I enjoy that part equally as much, you know, I'm not trying to get rid of it or try to heal it or anything, you know. It's a very good, the universe knows what it's doing, right? <laughs> it made me laugh because I, I saw this sort of, not a cartoon, it had actual pictures in it the other day where uh, on the top it had a, this beautiful picture of the Buddha and it said, how I think I sound when I talk about spiritual stuff. And, on, and then on the bottom it had a picture of Forrest Gump sitting on the bench and it said, how I sound to others when I talk about spiritual stuff. <laughs> exactly, exactly. I mean, part of the piece, part of the piece the uh the the lasting peace i'm not talking about the sense of the peaceful experience or the bliss that comes and goes i'm talking about part of the underlying peace that goes along with my experience comes from the sense that um i am perfectly imperfect and i don't have to uh heal anything or fix anything and that i don't have to be more enlightened or less enlightened or if i uh fall asleep in my identity or in my ego, my kids are getting on my nerves and I, and I want things to be different. Uh, there's nothing that's there to come around and judge and say, you should be more enlightened than that. You know? <laughs> it's just like, it is what it is, you know? Yeah. So it sounds like you're very accepting. Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. I'm very accepting. Yeah. I liked what you said, you know, your yes and no, when I asked, do you feel like you're done? Um, it's sort of like if somebody says, are you educated? Well, yeah, but am I as educated as a person can ever be? No, you know, so sort of like there's always more possibility. For especially, especially in this uh, community of non-duality, um, there's always an uh, answer that is on, it depends on the level of frequency, basically, and this is just um, for the lack of better terms, you know, depends on every question that you ask, I have to listen to the question and kind of extrapolate whether or not you're asking my ego. Do you want to know from Chad or do you want to know from the, you know, from a, a level of truth that's not kind of, that's not playing along in the role of, of duality. Mm -hmm. Like in order for us to have this conversation, you have to play the role as the interviewer and I have to play the role as the spiritually awakening <laughs> being and it's fun, you know, <laughs> but there is a, a level of truth or a level of knowing that is on a, I would say, deeper level. And, you know, if we go there, then we'll talk, it'll sound different, I think, you know? Yeah. Well, uh, and there is, and I've listened to a lot of your, I listen to all your YouTube videos and um, I convert things to audio and then listen while I'm cutting the grass and stuff. But um, you know, I, there's definitely a lot of genuineness and a, a lot of wisdom coming through. Uh, and it didn't sound like you just learned the, learned the lines, you know, learned what to say. It was like, you know, you've taken this stuff to heart and you're, you're speaking from your heart and coming out with some very helpful stuff for people. Well, like, I mean, um, really, I could say this, um, you know, when we, when I give interviews, you know, obviously, uh, in the in this as a spiritual teacher, you want to say things that are, you know, are, you know, 
that help push along the movement or the understanding. You don't want to say what everybody else is saying. You know, everybody says the same thing, regurgitates the same thing over and over again. So the good thing is, is that um, I don't really know a lot of the uh, the jargon. You know, I don't. I'm not um, educated in that sense. So I just kind of speak from my experience. And in that sense, it's always going to be, uh, you know, unique in a way. You know, it's always going to be fresh. You know? That's really what everybody should be doing, in my opinion. Um, even if they're saying stuff and, you know, quoting the Upanishads or, you know, um, speaking perennial wisdom, um, if they're not speaking from their experience or if they don't make it clear that they're not speaking from their experience and there's something disingenuous about it and it's not going to have the potency or the, the value that it would have if they're actually, you know, speaking from their experience. And I got to say that, uh, you know, um, with spiritual teachers, I, there is something in me that's, I, I mean, I'm just a big skeptic. I'm a very skeptical person, mm -hmm. you know, um, and I just feel like sometimes we are not being, I'm going to talk about spiritual teachers as we, you know, sometimes we are not being as honest as we can be, you know, and it, it's not helping people to uh, snap out of it. It's more so, pro, it's, it seems like it's prolonging, uh, uh, you know, just like, for example, let me give you a perfect example. It's, there's a when I teach, when I go to teach satsang, one of the main things that I try to do is let people know that um, there are no levels of spirituality. You know, there's no one who is more enlightened than anyone else. Or, um, and then I, I always get hit with the same thing. Oh, I just felt this person's presence when they, when I was in their presence. You know what I mean? And I just, uh, I'm like, well, you know, it's your presence. It's your presence. It's not anyone else's presence that can make you feel, you know, I, I'm just like, a, uh, and it, and whenever you feel like somebody else's presence is what's giving you this sense of uh, spiritual uh, enlightenment or giving you closer to the truth, then you're kind of, you know, shunning your own divinity in a way. And we need to recognize our own, each person, needs to recognize their own divinity and every teacher should be trying to help everyone see that you are the divine, you are the divine, you know? Yeah. And I don't, I don't know if I see that that much. Uh, yeah. Um, a few responses to that. Um, I saw this quote from Amma the other day, Amachi, you know, and uh, someone asked her, or, you know, there's a whole crowd around her and someone asked her, are these people worshiping you? And she said, no, I'm worshiping them. I, I see God in all of them. Um, and when you sit in the presence of somebody, somebody like that, there's definitely a, a sense of divinity that sort of saturates the atmosphere and you feel very uplifted and all. But it's not like she's sending cosmic woo rays, you know, from her to you or something. It's more like, right. it's, it's more like the kind of the, the ground of being is enlivened in that atmosphere and it's your own being and it's just it's getting enlivened in everyone and everything and, and therefore you feel this sort of upsurge or upliftment um, but, but it, again it's not a transmission from point A to point B it's more like a, uh, she's just serving as a sort of a fertilizer which enlivens the, the ground for everyone helps to enliven the ground for everyone and there's this synergy that takes place with the mutual participation of everyone there yeah, and, and it's just like when I read that book from Eckhart Tolle, something he said made everything uh, go silent. And I was present, and there was presence. And sometimes when you're in the presence of a being, uh, maybe when you see them, it causes you to go silent. But it's not them, it's your own divinity that you experience. You know, and, 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 and obviously, uh, it's all, they're all sensations, you know, this is all the world of sensations, but I, that's just my skepticism, probably, you know, just um, not seeing anyone as carrying around a spirit that can, that is any greater than anyone else, you know, mm -hmm. I feel like that's the, that's the way that this, um, it is out there, it seems. Yeah. 
Well, I think there's a yes and no to that one too. Um, okay. In that, um, you know, we're all the same spirit. We're all the same being. You know, they say that there's that saying that you know we're we're not human beings having spiritual experiences. We're spiritual beings having having a human experience. But it actually goes beyond that because we're we're being itself, which is not individuated. We're you know the cosmic person, the pure awareness. Uh, shining through all these different instruments, you know, your instrument, my instrument, and so on. And so in that sense, there are no levels, there's no difference. It's all God kind of seeing through inst various instruments of the divine, you know, this, right. this person, that person. But, mm -hmm. you know, but different instruments have different um, de radiating capacities. Like, you know, the, I'm looking at the light bulbs in my room, and some of them are brighter, some of them are dimmer, and so, but they're all tapped into the same electrical field. Yet they're designed in such a way that they have different capacities for, you know, transmitting that that field and converting it into lumens, into light. Per I mean, okay, perhaps, you know, that's all you could say. That's what it seems like, you know. Um, I I do, f I mean, I know I agree with you in that sense. Like there are, there's the physical, uh, there's the science. You know, there's a science, but then even science is for the sake of human understanding. It's just all here so that, you know, it's packaged in a way that uh, we can understand it, mm -hmm. you know. And, um, you know, the, since the whole uh, premise behind, uh, or not the whole premise, but the, the idea behind non-duality, I guess, or what will act ultimately cause all questions to cease is for there to be not just a understanding of non-duality but an actual uh experience of non-duality like a, oh, absolutely yeah. like to see that and then like t to see all of everything from the um you know from the bubble of truth mm -hmm. and then it all kind of everything kind of becomes uh, a, an experience as of or just like a temporary experience and there's really no truth to it but it's just how things seem mm -hmm. you know and and that definitely probably sounds like gobbledygook no it sounds good to me <laughs> you know i mean I can we, we can uh, we can clarify it as we go okay let's yeah. do that and actually a question came in this would be a good time to ask it um okay. chris from sacramento you must know him asks i don't know what non-duality is could you help me understand it this question must be a plant. You probably know this guy. <laughs> I don't. I, uh, Chris, okay. Uh, Non-duality. Um, Since we're going to use the term, we might as well define it. Yeah, and uh, that's that's going to be interesting. Um, I think non-duality is a great pointer uh, to help us to see that um, everything is one thing. Um, there's there could be countless definitions, but it's just another one of those pointers that uh, causes you to say, okay, it, you know, start questioning. I know that they're saying there's non-duality, but I see this pin here, and that's not me, so um, there's duality there. So instead of, I guess, trying to disprove it, you kind of kind of look within and see, okay, well then, what's what what might non-duality be pointing to and the only way to do that is to not try to go at it uh intellectually trying to understand it because the the tool that you use to understand non-duality is a tool that is in the world of duality so it it doesn't it can't understand it intellectually like that it has to be non-duality what it is has to be seen so that um then any question about it, it kind of loses its meaning in a way so i think uh always anytime a question like that comes in i just say okay well um non-duality will reveal itself in the stillness mm -hmm. you know sit still and then just pay attention and non-duality uh, will reveal itself and then the word non-duality will kind of be it will lose its meaning and all other concepts will lose their meaning um 
in that space. And then once you go back to thinking and participating in the world of duality, uh, you'll be able to talk about non-duality. You know, I think that's kind of how it works because um, a definition will will kind of be misleading in a sense. Yeah. Well, you talked about science a couple of minutes ago and, uh, you know, science could tell you, could tell us that on some level, the pen and your hand are, you know, the same thing. If you get down deep enough uh, on the, the, at the atomic level, you wouldn't be able to distinguish them because they're all just carbon and this and that, various you know, molecules and atoms. Uh, and you can go even deeper than that and everything's really all non-dual. It's all just the unified field or something. So that's, it's useful as a, as a metaphor, as an intellectual understanding. But what you're saying is that if this is to really be meaningful to us and, and have any kind of impact on our lives, it sh we should somehow settle into the actual experience of the non-dual and not just be satisfied with intellectual explanations like that. Yeah, I mean, because, um, you know, it's just like anything. Uh, you could go infinitely, anything you want to learn about, you could, you could learn... Uh, infinite, uh, infinite amount of information about this pen, and you can go as deep as you want to go, or you could just say it's a pen. And I don't think you know it's like uh, you know the same is kind of. I think th when it comes to this world of spiritual enlightenment, um, you could be infinitely complex, or you could be infinitely simple. Mm. And I think the 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 natural way to go about it is to go and you feel like you have to learn a lot and to go the uh, to find the complexity figure out the complexities of everything and then ultimately come to this spiritual awakening and the way from my experience that's not the way it happened you know in fact um, my ego needed to get to the point where it realized that it knew nothing and anything that it did know was still nothing. Uh, Muji says, if you multiply zero times anything, you get zero, right? So if you don't know everything, if you don't know all things, then you know nothing. The unknown so heavily outweighs in this metaphor, the known, that what can you really say is known? And even if you can say something is known, it's not important for the sake of spiritual awakening to know things, you know? And I, I, I can't even say that that's true because I did a lot of reading and learning uh, before uh, I was ultimately, you know, like, I guess I just kind of get exhausted with trying to learn, you know, I don't know what it is, you know? Yeah. Well, I think all the reading and learning kind of gives you tools for being able to talk about it. But if you think that just the reading and learning is going to give you the experience of it, then you're going to be disappointed. You know, as, as Christ said, you know, except you be as little children, you shall not enter the kingdom of heaven. So he's talking about simplicity there. Um, yes. And yes. Uh, he's not saying we should all be uneducated or, uh, you know, unable to express ourselves or anything like that. But there's, there's a sort of a sim simplicity about wise souls, even though that might be very learned in, in a way, but there's a childlike innocence about them. You look at somebody like Thich Nhat Hanh or, you know, Dalai Lama or something, that there's this sort of innocent sweetness about them that shines through. I think that's what you're alluding to. Yeah, I do. I mean, I think that there's a, um, it's kind of like in order to, you have to have the courage to go in the opposite direction that you've been conditioned to go in order to find what you're looking for when it comes to spiritual enlightenment, I guess. You know, it's like we've been trained to learn and to study and to go there. And uh, I think the final question, the final question when you when you have no more questions, it just comes down to, uh, you know, I know nothing, basically. Um, that's what allows me to rest. And I had to rest in I know nothing before I had the courage to go out and start reading and enjoying life again. I had to really see that uh, the, I, I, all my wisdom, any wisdom that, com that I have comes from when I am not using my intellect it's from uh 
being silent and just um, experiencing. And, and then I'm able to recognize the obvious. Um, I think the, the obviousness of the neutrality of everything is crying out, but we're all so asleep in our uh, collective dream of this collective dream of bodies <laughs> and our story you know, that we can't see the obviousness, uh, you know, of how neutral and silent everything is, um, you know, just, and it's just waiting here for us to recognize, you know. Um, yeah, yeah. A, a teacher of mine used to say, was fond of saying that the, the way ordinary education works is the more you learn, the more you realize how little you know. And, uh, it just uh, so in a, in a sense ignorance expands faster than knowledge does um, yeah yeah but um, but he always sort of emphasized that there's a, there's a field which is what you're alluding to here which is he called the home of all knowledge that it, all sort of all the sort of branches of information that sprout out as the universe reside there in, in their ultimate seed form and if you can establish your awareness there then you'll have the benefit of all knowledge without having to go through the tedious and impossible task of actually acquiring all knowledge. Which, which is impossible, right? Right. right. So, uh, <laughs> you know, it all comes back down to, uh, to grace, you know, it all comes back down to, uh, grace and, um, what is being revealed to you. Uh, and it'll be revealed to you in the form of, you know, it'll have the sensation of possibly, you know, you learned it or you, um, you know, you read something, you got an aha moment or however the universe just uh, creatively gives you this, uh, decides to uh, give you this experience. Ultimately, it all comes back down to grace and, um, you know, something being revealed as opposed to, you know, discovered. Yeah. So you went through like years of, you know, watching Bat Gap interviews. <laughs> yeah, I was actually just starting Bat Gap around the time you had that breakthrough with Eckhart Tolle, uh, 2009. And, uh, you know, you watched tons of Muji interviews and talks and everything like that. And did you, um, do you still kind of gobble that stuff up or did you eventually reach a phase at which you didn't even bother listening to things anymore? Um, yeah, I don't really uh, I don't really, uh, watch videos anymore and not until, uh, you know, I found out I was going to do this video, this, uh, you know, this interview and I was like, Oh, you know, so, but every now and then I'll go back and, um, you know, just see what Muji, you know, listen to Muji and kind of get that nostalgic feeling. He's, he doesn't know it, but he's my uncle. No, he's like, uh, I feel like, you know, I watch so I watch him so much on auto play and just so many hours of Muji. Mm. But now, you know, it just doesn't. You know, it's more for just like curiosity or entertainment. You know, and I have a very short attention span with mm. uh, spiritual teachers, basically, right mm. now. Yeah, personally, I. I hardly ever watch things because I don't like to sit at my computer any more than I already do. But I'm kind of a, a podcast junkie, and I always got these things in my ears, listening to some interesting thing while I'm riding my bike or something. I kill two birds with one stone. Oh yeah, I do that too. Uh, nowadays, um, I listen to more. Uh, I listen to. I've been listening to someone talk about you know, financial management or you know. Just, I'm just always trying to better myself, uh, improve my, uh, you know, I have, a, I have a lot of learning to do still. And now I could, uh, you know, I'm free to explore anything I want to explore without the psychological um, drama to along with trying to be something else or whatever, you know. So um, what do you... Uh actually talk about when you when you do sot songs what do you and what sort of tools if any do you equip people with so that they can be exploring on their own um 
Uh, satsung, when I talk, go to satsung, I really have, um, it could be a variety of topics, but, you know, m my goal with satsung is to just be as honest as I could be, you know, and just to be, um, I, I, I always make sure that I, I let the people know some of the things that I do that they wouldn't expect for an enlightened person to do because I have a ton of examples, you know, what, I mean, for instance, I don't know. I mean, uh, you know, uh, you know, getting irritated with my kids is a very, I have five kids and I'm not as patient as I, uh, sh as maybe, uh, Muji would be, you know, <laughs> I don't know. Who knows? He doesn't have any kids or if he does, they're not around. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, um, um, but I, you know, I have, I'm just so, you know, like when I play basketball, sometimes it'll get heated, you know, and I want to win, you know, I'm just very competitive in that sense, or, um, you know, just very, I'm, uh, like I said, I have, um, I'm, I'm both, I'm half monkey, half mystic, you know what I mean, and I, I embrace, and, and just because, um, I've played hard, you know, like in my role as Chad, I don't, I no longer feel like I have to, um, monitor my spirituality to make sure that I, um, don't go too far, uh, you know, into my egoic role or that I, I might somehow, you know, lose it and be, you know, or I don't know, you know, yeah. I just, I'm free. You know, I remember when I first had my spiritual awakening, um, I was very um, detached from the world, basically. Um, I didn't, I, I wore the same clothes every day and I just was just not interested in uh, social things or any type of endeavors. I didn't have any goals or dreams. There was no goals or dreams. Nothing else mattered. And I was very cautious about, you know, you know, people would, I, I was, I'm also a hip hop artist and people would ask me to uh, do shows or to do a YouTube video with them. And I was like, no, nah, I don't want to do anything right now because I don't want to, um, you know, I don't want to make any waves in this calm, in these calm waters, you know? And it was just a, it was a very insecure uh, feeling of, you know, since that I had, I could lose it in a way. And, you know, and as time goes on, you know, it's just, that just kind of dissolves in a way. And now my life is very much, I'm very secure. I don't, there's not a, I'm not very spiritual. Um, I'm not, I don't, I'm not a very devout, um, you know, anything. I, I'll go to church. I, I could, I, I'm not, uh, you know, I can embrace Christianity, my Christian uh, roots, and and participate fully in in religion. You know, as <laughs> you know, I could I could go to church and enjoy a service and not be in there judging, you know, too much. You know, and um, I just could be I could just allow the universe to do whatever it wants to do through this vessel without interfering in any way, and um, it's just. That's true freedom. Um, yeah, that's great. Yeah. It's funny when you said religion, it's kind of a, you, you looked a little bit like Chris Rock for a second. This is the expression <laughs> he makes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, you know, uh, I, I mean, I, I was really at war with, um, not at war, but a very, you know, you know, once I had my spiritual awakening, I wanted to really let Christians know that there's more God out there, mm -hmm. you know, and then, you know, just very, I was very, um, once my ego got back involved, I was just very not um, patient with others. Um, I think my ego was just as, um, it just, instead of my ego focused on trying to become the next um, Johnny Cochran or the best lawyer in the world, now my ego is letting people know how spiritually enlightened I was because. Mm, yeah. Spirit, I, spiritualized ego, as people say. Oh, I got it. I got it. I got it bad. I got it so bad that, um, you know, uh, 
I really, I mean, I'm glad it happened the way it did, but I really put myself in some embarrassing situations, you know, and it, it's, it's for humility. Humility is the key. Yeah. Humility is the key. And um, your ego, you know, your ego, I mean, my ego needed to be humbled uh, over and over and over and over again. And even to this day, um, you know, I, I get a gentle reminder from the universe that, um, you know, you know, you are, you know, I am in control of things or when I say I, I'm saying this, this intelligence that has us here. The universe. Or, well, yeah. 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 The universe right. or God is right. kind of orchestrating these things, you right. know, and you, I give you the sense. I will give you the sense that you have wisdom and I will put people around you that want to hear what you have to say. And when they ask questions, you'll be able to give them the answer. But you have to remember the source because otherwise, uh, you know, life will have to remind you, yeah. <laughs> you know, and it does all the time. Yeah, that's very well put. You know, I, th I think that people kind of wake up as and who they are. It's not like we're all going to become St. Francis of Assisi or something, right. um, which is, but that's not to say that uh, a murderer is going to be some enlightened murderer who's going to go on murdering people. Um, you know, definite changes in personality take place, but there, there are certain fundamental attributes of personality and behavior and this and that and habits and tendencies that, you know, you might have all your life, no matter how, and quote unquote, enlightened you become. Exactly. Yeah. And I, and I have to say that, um, the opposite is also true. Like, um, w before I read that, uh, book, Eckhart Tolle, uh, The Power of Now, me and my wife's marriage was just not good. We were basically just roommates, you know, and, you know, there was no trust from either end, from either side, you know, uh, you know, it was just, a fundamental like division there was just too much ego and um i i was you know i had problems with my professors in law school um because i felt like i was more than i you know I, I, you know i have i told you i was in mock trial we talked about it i i did mock trial when i was in law school and i and i was in this competition early like my first year in law school and it was like all first year students like over 100 students and i won that competition and i hit and i'm working full time and i'm just kind of doing it into my spare time and i won the competition and i just you know it just went to my head i felt like oh, i'm i'm killing it and you know obviously uh once i started and then i started having these panic attacks and everything started to unravel and now I'm blaming uh, my professors and I'm taking chances in law school. I'm cutting corners and I'm getting disciplined and it's just a lot going on. And um, it's just, it was very humbling. Um, it was a very humbling experience. I, I mean, I kind of lost my train of thought, but I think- No, you're, you're talking about humility and, um, and making the point that you, and we've been talking about this for a couple of minutes in a way, of how if you're on a spiritual path, the, the ego can still try to usurp it and uh, you know think that, oh, I'm so spiritual. In fact, there's this real funny guy that puts out these YouTube videos about being ultra-spiritual. You may have seen him. He wears like a headband and kind of long red hair. <laughs> uh, Tammy Simon interviewed him recently. But um, I think that another thing, though, is if, if, you're, if you're sincerely committed to spiritual unfoldment, uh, you know, it's like God or whoever says, okay, buddy, you know, you asked for it. Now I'm going to grind you down a bit if necessary, uh, you know, and, and humble you because you're not going to, you know, as, as Jesus said, it's easier for a camel to pass through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven. And I think by rich man, he really meant egotistical person. You know, you have to sort of have that humility to, uh, to get there. Um, and, Absolutely. And so, and, and if you don't have it, or and none of us do perfectly, then we're going to get smacked around a bit by situations which will help to um, refine us and, and diminish the the sense of me, me, me. Yeah, absolutely. And you be and after over time, you just become 
you, even when my uh, ego uh, rears its ugly head, um, you know, I just kind of notice, you know, it's it's not a ne necessarily a bad thing, but I just kind of notice. Like even, um, you know, being asked to be interviewed by you is like, whoa, you know, that's like a rite of passage, you know? <laughs> I'm official now, right? <laughs> you know? Yeah, don't so worry. That, I've, I've interviewed all kinds of bozos, so don't let it get in. <laughs> I, I know, exactly. So, you know, but, you know, even that in itself, it was just like, I get to laugh at myself a lot. And <laughs> I think that is part of why um, people come back to satsang. You yeah. know, it's just because we're in there together. Yeah. And, and I just, I get to kind of facilitate the conversation. And um, um, I used to, went in the early days after I, you know, I told, I don't know if I told you this, but um, it, it might be in my bio that like not long after I had that spiritual awakening with, um, at Borders Books, I started teaching like, uh -huh, right. like right away. Like, yeah. And it was just ridiculous. <laughs> but, I, but the thing is like what the teaching itself was, you know, it was helpful and, you know, I still stay in touch with a lot of those people from those early days yeah. and, you know, it's just a beautiful thing. But looking back on where I was um, spiritually and what I was going through psychologically, it just yeah. didn't match, you know, and I wanted to be a teacher so bad. I wanted to, you know, be enlightened. And I, I thought that was, was my calling because anybody that has such a drastic shift, they must be called to be a teacher. Yeah. And now, and now more so, you know, like, uh, you know, I go to Sasson because I love the people that I meet with every month, but I don't need, I don't need to be a teacher. You know, I got, you know, well, you know, I, I, I think if things. you keep it real as you're doing, then you can, you can do it. You know I mean? You don't have to be the most, you don't have to be a Buddha to get out there and teach. Um, and if, if, if we do get puffed up, then the bigger they are, the harder they fall. You know, there's been plenty of examples of that. But I mean, I became a, a TM teacher when I was 21. And, uh, you know, when I, when I was trained, uh, Marishi said, well, you know, when there's a war on, you can't afford to train sharpshooters. You just have to give everybody a rifle and send them out there. So I'm, you know, he was basically saying, you know, you're a bunch of half-baked idiots, but <laughs> I'm going to get you, get you out there teaching because there's a need. And, and as long as, and I, I had some friends who it went to their heads and they were like getting up on a couch and having people hand them flowers and stuff and they crashed and burned. But, you know, if you, if you kept it real and said, hey, I'm just a guy, I've been meditating a couple of years, I have something valuable to offer and here it is, then that, that worked. Yeah, and what I've really found is really helpful is, you know, like the, the, the spiritual awakening that I had that even gives me the right to be given this interview or to give satsang, um, that came as a result of, you know, teaching and learning simultaneously. Like, um, I get excited to, one of the reasons why I was excited to give this interview is because I, I don't know what I'm going to learn from what I might say or what you might say, you know. Um, you surprise yourself sometimes, don't you? Ask, ask all the time, all the time. And I get credit for it, you know. I get credit for, <laughs> for being this enlightened, this, you know, this, wow, that was that was so good. Or I'll, I might come up with a story. Like sometimes I'll be in satsang and somebody will ask me a question. And then as soon as they ask the question, I'll sit for a moment and then I'll just break into this story. Yeah. And I don't know where the story's going. I kind of know what is going, but I, I don't know how, I've never told the story. And then when, when I bring it home, I sit there and then they're like, oh yeah, that's perfect. That's exactly what I was talking about. And I'm like, wow, where did that come from? That's and cool, then, isn't, I, it? isn't that the neatest experience? It's amazing. It's like you're kind of like getting out of the way and letting the, letting the divine use you as a loudspeaker and and the stuff that comes through is uh, you know out of the mouths of babes so to speak you know so much so and to the point where it's not for them you know I I um you know I 
spiritual as a spiritual teacher i give them that role but there's a it's like while i'm in the role i already know like it, on the level of duality there's a teacher and a student but in truth there's just this experience that i'm having i don't have any proof that you are not a projection you know i don't have any proof that anyone that i see or anything that i see is not a projection i don't have any proof that even this this body and my uh, sense of, of of separateness is not a projection, um, and I don't assume that it's not. It's, it's not. It's not important. I just know that when I'm uh, when I'm speaking, um, there is not necessarily for the audience. Um, I always even even non spiritual advice. I'll my I'll talk to my teenage daughter about something and I'll tell her something and I'll give her some advice and she'll go away and immediately I have to turn it on myself and say okay why are you why did you have that experience you know and not necessarily ask that question but just kind of sit with that advice that I gave because any advice I give is always applicable to my own life in some way you know and Sometimes I do that after the fact, or but sometimes it's while I'm speaking, even as I'm speaking, as though the voice is speaking um, to myself, to without any better way to, and that's not that's not completely accurate, but that's the best words I have. I know what you mean. Um, a couple of questions came in from the audience. Let's get to them. Um, okay. One is from Dan in London. He wants to know. Did you have any experiences of a spiritual nature as a child? Um, okay, so I'm gonna say yes and no again, right? So uh, as a child, I do remember uh, um, laying in bed in my grandmother's house. So I don't know, I had to be, you know, between the age of four and seven, eight, you know, four and eight, you know, and watching my thoughts so that's when i when i give mindfulness exercises to people who are not necessarily uh interested in non-duality or advice or whatever and i just give mindfulness workshop um i always go back to just the fundamentals of how what are the mechanics of this thing you know because if you just talk about the mechanics sometimes that'll foster some type of understanding and one of the things i do is i say okay we're gonna i do exercise like okay we're gonna sit and just watch our thoughts, you know, and we'll count and we'll just sit and watch our thoughts, you know. And, you know, watch them, um, when I say watch my thoughts, uh, it's in a way, you know, it's like watching them objectively and getting used to the experience of watching your thoughts objectively uh, because that's not something that we are taught or it just doesn't feel natural, you know? It doesn't seem like you could watch your own thoughts objectively. Um, and I remember as a young child, sitting watching my thoughts talk, to, you know, watching me talk to myself and being the silent watcher of my own thoughts talking to myself. But it was it was just like a, a you know, it, that that's pretty much it. Um, I grew up in the church and I, always had a relationship with God and I and, and I was always in my youth group and I, I you know I prayed um, although there was always something missing I felt like I was faking it sometimes you know but I feel like God was uh, I always you know I, I believe that that relationship with God that I had early on was sincere it's nothing like the experience I had after um, my reading the power of now but it was it was like I always felt like God was out there somewhere, mm -hmm. you know, and I believe that, or I, it, it, from my experience, it seemed like God kind of honored that, even though I was looking else outside of myself for God, you know, that was, that was the extent of my experience up until, um, my spiritual awakening. Cool. Um, speaking of your spiritual awakening, Lauren from Brazil asks, after your awakening, did you experience a, f a phase of the dark night of the soul? You mentioned that you went through heaven and hell, if I heard you correctly. If so, how long did that period last, and didn't it bring you into greater surrender and devotion? Thanks. 
Yeah, um, I definitely went through that uh, period of um, of like confusion. I remember crying tears of like joy, just saying, what is happening? You know, and just crying. I remember this specifically. One time I got out of the gym and I was just sitting in my car um, after playing basketball and um, I was just in the car and I was just crying, sweeping, crying, you know, just saying, why is this happening? You know, what is this? What is going on here? What is this? You know, and just being overcome with a sense of unconditional love from uh, from, you know, God or the creator, the intelligence that has me here. And then at the same time, during that same period of time, I remember crying, uh, saying, I didn't ask for this. Why, why are you doing this? Shaking my fist at God, you know, just really saying, um, you know, I, I just don't, you know, crying the same tears, but just being so confused, like exhausted, tired, you know, and just like, what is going on? You know, when is this going to be over? And just, uh, it was a very, it's a very, it was a very confusing time. How long it lasted? Uh, the end of it was so subtle that I don't even know. You know, it just dissipated slowly but surely. And I can't even put a time. If I told you how long it lasted, I would be making something up. Mm -hmm. um, um, it just kind of dissipated over time. Uh, you know, and, and the same with like uh, spiritual experiences, you know, I used to have these incredible experiences that, um, you know, uh, I don't even really like to share because, um, you know, they're just like really unbelievable and they're just temporary experiences that come and goes. But the experience was so amazing at the time. It just, uh, you know, encouraged me to seek more and seek more, trying to recreate maybe that experience or something like it, you know. But then after a while, you know, spiritual experiences are kind of like, uh, you know, it's just like you don't really need, I don't really need a spiritual experience because, you know, what could be more spiritual, what could be more of a spiritual experience than, than this conversation or just this moment, you know, I feel like, at, when you first have your spiritual awakening, you need proof that this is real. And this is just my, um, you know, just my take on things. So you have to have these amazing out of, you know, like, you know, out of, you know, otherworldly yeah, kind of. They're very convincing, right? Yeah. Very convincing. And that if you explain it to somebody else, they'd be like, yeah, right. You know, that didn't happen. <laughs> or maybe that was just your, you know, you thought it felt like that. But, um, but I just don't think that there's a need for that mm. at, anymore, you know? I want to play a little devil's advocate on that one. I think I heard you quote Aldous Huxley, I don't know if, if you mentioned it by name, saying, uh, when you get the message, hang up the phone. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, And he was actually referring to drug experiences, you know, psychedelics and all, meaning you don't keep taking them once you get the point. There's higher you know, dimensions and so on. Um, oh, really? Pardon? I didn't know that's what he was referring to. I, I mean, believe, I never yeah, heard that's what he was referring to because he he did psychedelics and he was just saying you don't keep doing them and doing them and doing them. You you get the idea. There's oh, oh, there's more to life than meets the eye, and then you find more sort of permanent, um, healthy ways of of discovering it. But okay. um, but I just wanted the, the devil's advocate part is just that um, you know, I, I know people who have been on the spiritual path for decades and they're very well grounded and and nice profound state of self-realization or whatever you want to call it uh, and we can think of historical examples too of various saints and sages and siddhas and you know people like that and they continue to have really profound experiences they don't think that these experiences are something they need to hang on to but they come and go just as maybe good food comes and goes as you go through your your life you know eating in various places uh, so it's, it's sort of like you I wouldn't necessarily give the impression that uh, an awakened person or an enlightened person isn't going to have profound experiences still that come and go. It's just that they realize that those things are transitory and there's a ground that they rest in that is, that's the real significant thing. Well, uh, okay, so what I'll say is like, um, 
I think that the universe knows what it's doing and that sometimes uh, the universe can cause a, uh, we we as we call them spiritual experiences but the universe will or uh, will reveal or you know just reveal those experience make a very everyday ordinary experience uh, more profound or like I, yesterday, for example, um, I was, where was I? Somewhere looking at a tree. Oh, I, I was, uh, I drive Uber by the way. And I went into, um, Walgreens. It was late at night. So I got a five hour energy and I was standing outside of Walgreens and I took a five hour energy and it was so quiet. I mean, it wasn't quiet. The cars were there, but it was quiet in my in, within. I wasn't thinking a lot, and I was looking at this tree, and I just stared at the tree, and it was just, um, you know, I could say it was amazing. You know, it was just like I, the tree was just like uh, came alive. It was just standing there, and I was sober, and I was just looking at this tree, and then I just carried on when got in the car and started driving, but that in itself was like, I guess you could say that was a spiritual experience. Yeah. That's not like early on when, um, I'll, I'll give you an example of a spiritual experience I had early on. Okay. That, okay. So I'm sitting by the river one day and it's kind of, um, it's kind of misting a little bit and, you know, I would go through phases where I would be try I would try I'd be trying to get back to the stillness. So I'd be sitting by the river and I would be trying to make my mind go still. And then what happened was when I finally came to this place of complete stillness, it was the rain stopped. And I noticed it. And I started looking around and my mind started going and then it would start raining again. And I would look around, and I was like, oh my God, it's raining. And I was like, let's see if I can do it again. And then I would be struggling, struggling. And then all of a sudden I'd fall right back into the bliss. And then the rain would stop. So you thought you were controlling the rain or something? Well, I didn't think that at all. Uh -huh. <laughs> I didn't think I was controlling the rain. Well, maybe I did think that. I don't know. All I can say is that that happened like two or three or four, maybe three times mm -hmm. to where it was obvious. Like, wow. It may have been. I, I mean, if Jesus can, can calm those seas, you know, why not? Uh... It, it really doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if it really happened. I don't even know if that was a dream. Or did it really happen or did it not? It doesn't even matter. But uh, for some reason back then, I needed that type of experience. Yeah. Now... Uh, I'm not in that phase of seeking right now. I'm not trying to, uh, I don't need the universe to prove itself right. to me, you know? So I think the spiritual experiences are more sober. They're just more subtle and just, um, just different. I can't say no spiritual experiences. I just think that it's just a different type of, and then all, also, um, even the spiritual experiences that I had, I had no idea what they would be like before they came. So that still holds true today. There may be a spiritual experience that I'm, I experience tomorrow or coming up that I never have experienced. So um, it's definitely not absolute like that. Okay. Hey, just a little something that has nothing to do with this interview, is, but since you mentioned five hour energy, uh -huh. um, people listening might want to check this out. It's, there's a documentary on YouTube called Billions in Change. And it's by the guy who invented five hour energy. And he found, uh -huh. he found himself all of a sudden a multi billionaire. And he thought, what am I going to do with all this money? So he set up this whole workshop, this thing in Michigan, where he, um, it's like a think tank where they invent all kinds of amazing things to help the world, like being able to purify water with these machines that they can ship all over to these little villages and things that help health and all kinds of stuff. So whatever karma he's getting by selling this crap and having people drink it, <laughs> he's offsetting by exactly. doing some really good stuff. <laughs> Absolutely. You know, uh, especially, you know, driving Uber at 2.30 in the morning, you know, mm. uh, sometimes you need, I need a little a boost. Yeah, well, I hope you pass the bar exams and you can <laughs> have an easier ride in that regard. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> I will. Here's a question that came in from uh, Paul in Brisbane, Australia. He asks, when an awakening happens and then a teaching comes from that awakening, 
would that teaching, in fact, have brought on that awakening before the moment of grace? That is, would the teacher's own teaching have awakened them? Um, this, is my, this is my frustration when listening to spiritual teachers who are just as lost as we are before their moment of clarity. Do you understand the question? I'm not entirely sure that I do, but maybe you got something out of it. Um, well, what I can say to that is that, um, you know, for those on a spiritual journey, um, we're very confused about cause and effect. Mm -hmm. And um, the we don't really understand how time works. Mm -hmm. The mind can't understand the sense, the the uh, idea or the the phenomena of time moving from past. And like right now, we're in the present, but time is moving forward. You know, and that's very confusing. And it's really confusing when it comes to the conversation of when someone is enlightened or you know because now you're talking about timelessness in the same language or the same conversation that you're talking about uh time bound events and it just doesn't work um in other words time's uh, not so linear as we might think it's absolutely absolutely all everything is already i mean not, i'm not saying i don't want to say everything is already predestined because that's also time bound language all i'm saying is that um the now unfolds in a way that we can't understand. And, um, you know, spiritual teachers may be completely trying to uh, brainwash you and something that they say uh, causes you to have uh, an awakening. It doesn't matter. You could hear it from a spiritual teacher or you can hear it from a cartoon or a commercial. It's not a, once once the shift happens or once you fall into that instantaneous moment of stillness, then uh, the cause and effect part of it, who told you or who said it or when it happened or all that, it just becomes meaningless. It loses all its meaning. Everything becomes silent and neutral. Mm -hmm. And um, I don't know if that completely answers the question, but uh, spiritual teachers are very human, you know, and, you know, every, the most profound spiritual teacher that you've read about for centuries, um, it, you know, is misleading in a, in a way. Every, every spiritual teacher is misleading the people because we, we don't, you don't have the words to express what you're trying to convey. There's no words to do it. So we're just all kind of just talking, you know, and hopefully at some point, you know, some somebody somewhere hears something that, uh, you know, that gives them that aha moment. And then all of a sudden, like, um, and then the person who has the aha moment, they sit in that bliss. And then once their ego kicks back in, they give that teacher credit mm -hmm. for saying it. You know what I mean? As opposed to just knowing that grace, there's a there's a bigger picture here. It's not it, it, the the story of enlightenment doesn't have individuals. Mm. You know, the story of enlightenment is not an individual story. It's a holistic, all at once happening that is um, now. If you're looking in your story to find it, then it will forever evade you, your you know, you'll never be able to grasp it because you're looking in a story or in a, in a person to, to, I mean, that's not necessarily true either because I hear all stories of um, people who had spiritual teachers and teachers who've, you know, took them from one phase to another, you know, but um, from my experience, um, you know, there is definitely the ultimate enlightenment or the uh, what we're ultimately seeking has nothing to do with uh, others or form or concepts or stories, you know, so we have to be able to take our attention away from uh, all teachers. It's kind of like, um, you know, uh, 
like watching video, you're watching videos, you're hooked on the video because that's your, it's like your pacifier, mm. you know, or books, it's like a pacifier. And some people just want to stay on the pacifier. They never want to, uh, they never want to put the pacifier down and just, uh, you know, go into the unknown without anybody guiding. And I think that is the only way. No one can hold your hand all the way home. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I mean, I have a good friend who used to be with Adyashanti a whole lot. In fact, a number of friends. But uh, and at a certain point, he said to her, you know, you really don't need to come here anymore. And it's not like he didn't like her or, you know, uh, she, was, she did anything wrong. It's like, you know, hey, you, 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 it's time to take off the training wheels. Uh, but, you know, but she gives tremendous um, credit to the time she spent with him. So there's a time, I would say, you know, to everything there is a season, turn, turn, turn. You know, there is a time for being with a spiritual teacher. There may be a time for leaving a spiritual teacher. And you can't make a sort of a general rule that applies equally to everyone always. Uh, I, yeah, that's very true. Um, the only rule that I think applies to everyone always is that um, a spiritual teacher can, cannot hold your hand all the way home. Right. Right. It's some. It's like um, they can't remember, do it for you. Also, another way of looking at it. It's like you know you got to sort of pay your own dues and do your own and, work. And, well, yeah, you have to do your own work, and you have to uh, turn. Uh, instead of looking for wisdom outside of you, at some point you have to trust the wisdom that's within, because that within that wisdom within is what that's what it's all uh, about. That's what's all about. That yeah. that stops the questions. Yeah. 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 So Paul from Brisbane, if we didn't answer your question, if if Chad didn't answer your question, feel free to ask a follow up. It'd be fine. Um, yeah. But hopefully we got it. <clears throat> um, yeah. Okay, so what shall we talk about now? I don't have a question in my mind right this minute, but um, what haven't we talked about that you'd like to you'd like to say? Um, you know what I I think uh, I wouldn't mind talking about a little bit is just kind of the um, you know how uh, the idea of using other like. My, my, one of my hobbies, your hobby is to give these interviews. My hobby is to come up with creative ways to talk about, to demystify uh, mysticism in a way, you know? Yeah, you're good at that, by the way. I love the, the metaphors that you come up with and the little practical examples from daily life and all the illustrate points. I've heard you do that a number of times and I think, I think it's really nice. Yeah, that's a, that's a, a big ha a hobby of mine. And I think, um, I think younger, the younger generation uh, are less conditioned. So it seems like sometimes they're more open to it. Like I'll go speak at, at the college to college students and like right there in class, um, you know, you'll have so many, I mean, you'll have, I have people will be having experiences right in class and I'm definitely uh, presenting it in a, you know, motivational presentation type uh in a type way but they're uh having these experiences right there in class because they're just kind of like open to it you know mm -hmm. and they don't have any preconceived you know i guess barriers I'm, I'm sure they fall right back into their normal uh routine possibly you know but they're definitely open to it, you know? Oh, yeah. And these things leave a residue. I mean, you, ha you have these, any kind of experience like that, and it leaves an impression. I mean, you know, you might, you remember some experiences you had when you were a little kid. So it's any little exposure is good. Yeah, and again, it helps me to find the more different, the, uh, the more variety, the wider variety of ways that I have to articulate it also helps clarify my own uh i guess clarify my own seeing in a way um not that it i mean i i can always use more uh like i said my, i'm very i'm immature in a way i'm very immature spiritually and i say that because you know 2009 or whenever i read that book is not that long it was not that long ago right so 
And then, uh, uh, so my conditioning has not completely caught up with my uh, understanding or my knowing, you know? Well, I got so, news for you. I mean, I've been doing this stuff since 1968, <laughs> and I feel like I'm very immature spiritually. You know, there's, there's, you, I mean, if you want to compare yourself with people, there, there are always people who are light years beyond in terms of their spiritual maturity. So, as Ajashanti always put it, you know, I, I feel like I'm always a beginner. Yeah, and that's the best way to be because it's like somebody who, um, I, I look at it like um, somebody who only likes one type of music, you know, it's like, well, that's cool if that type of music is on. But what if you're the type of person that likes all music? Yeah. Now, that's a nice life to live. Mm -hmm. And I feel like with me staying a baby, in a sense, in the spiritual world, there's infinite unfolding. There's infinite learning. Or, or, or just, yeah, there's infinite learning or reconditioning. Like, I get to see uh, the evolution, I guess, of how my ego my egoic identification matures more, uh, you know, and does, you know, I guess less, uh, less um, self-inflicted suffering or uh, no, because sometimes I suffer and, you know, that's just a part of it. I don't know that, um, I don't know that I want anything to change, but I do feel like a, there's, I still feel like a baby, like I'm still maturing. You I, know? I think that might be what beginner, they mean by beginner's mind in, in Zen, you know, that, and it's actually a good thing to always have that attitude of only being a beginner. Um, yeah. It's funny you use that music example, because I remember hearing Paul McCartney say one time, and you know, he's probably one of the greatest musicians of our age, that he just likes all kinds of music. And he actually specifically mentioned rap and heavy metal and everything. He just exposes himself to the whole gamut and it's interesting because um, you know I'll do a particular interview like last two weeks ago I did one with this woman who's a psychic and, and a channeler and she got a certain amount of negative reaction it's like why you you know boy bad gap has reached a new low why are you interviewing somebody like this and uh, people are leaving comments like that and my attitude is that there for some people that could be huge I mean they can it can make them realize that there's um, not there's more to life than just this physical dimension you know, so that can be the perfect teaching for somebody. It's not necessarily the universal teaching for everybody, but look at the way God designs creation. There's just huge variety, and um, you know, the and uh, different strokes for different folks, as Sly and the Family Stone once sang. Absolutely, and I think that 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 was a huge part of my uh, awakening, as from my from my sense of of uh, things, I would. Uh, you know, well, my wife just passed me a note. She, she wanted me to add that most of the feedback from that for that woman was very positive. That there were a few people who were griping about it and you know saying that it was off topic or something. I just feel like spirituality is much broader and more diverse than some people would like to believe. And people get a little bit fundamentalist fundamentalist in, in insisting that it has to be this particular way and no other. You know, exactly. And that's just as um, you know, it's like. Um, People can't see their own, uh, like, for example, let me give an example. Um, when you're, uh, I, had, I had a situation where my wife and the neighbor, a good friend of her, they were having a discussion about someone else. And in my head, I was saying, you know, why are you judging them? Why are you judging that person? That person is who they are. Why are you judging them, right? And then, but I didn't say anything. I didn't speak up on it. You know, I just kind of was in my head thinking, you're judging them, right? And then, obviously, uh, you know, but before I could get to my back to my office, uh, I kind of realized that I was judging my wife and her friend. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. It's like, it, it's all, it's, it's like, you have to be, uh, um, very open to what you can learn from everything. Like I, for a while, I was very turned off from Christianity. You know, I felt like uh, I, really what I realized that I was turned off from a lot of Christians and the teaching of Christianity. But um, even that is, is, is not, 
you know, there's no justification for that. It's like there's a lot of uh, Christians that are doing a lot of uh, very good, uh, you know, valuable work. Oh, yeah. And we, sh we should be uh, very and, you know, see what we can learn from uh, Christians, see what we can learn from these different teachings. Even like when I, you know, I remember when I was younger, if someone was doing voodoo, then that was definitely from the devil. You know, if you're a voodoo, you know, doing voodoo. But then when I was going through my spiritual awakening, I was free. I wasn't scared of exploring anything. And I remember watching a, a lady talk about uh, voodoo and I was like, man, voodoo? Let me see what she's saying. And she was really uh, making a lot of sense. You know, she was speaking. I don't remember. I mean, I, I don't remember specifically, but I remember thinking, wow, uh, I would have never even listened to her if I was, uh, you know, already saying that she was from the devil. So yeah. um, you could learn, you know, God is in control, you know. Just as you were saying that, an email came in from somebody saying that Willie Nelson said that Frank Sinatra was his mentor, you know. I mean, so if you get outside our, our genre, our, our, custom, our comfort zone, you're more, probably more likely to learn something new than if you just stay in your niche. Absolutely, absolutely. You, we need to be, uh, actually, that's, that's exactly what we need to do. We need to be outside of our comfort zone, which another way to say that is we need to be exposed to our own conditioning. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like our own conditioning is very like sly and sneaky. It's, it can hide itself very well. And, um, you know, uh, uh, you know, being or being able to recognize your own conditioning is like one, a major component to being able to say or to be an uh, awakening, you know, to the awakening process, you know. Hmm. Is there any chance that... Um you'd actually be able to do a rap thing during this interview or do you need preparation or music or something? <laughs> um, no, I mean, I, I always have uh, something that I could do. Um, uh, so, let me see. I guess you call it hip hop or is that synonymous yeah. with rap or is it better to say hip hop? Uh, I don't know, uh, it, it depends matter. on I guess it depends on the person you're talking to, right? <laughs> uh, some people want to segregate them, and other people are just like, it's all good. Uh -huh. For me, for me, um, I, I, it doesn't matter. I just, uh, you know, I just I make rhymes, and I try to make them in a way that um, is, you know, will, you know, not, not only be respected in the hip hop community for the complexity or for the authenticity of the lyrics, but also that is bringing some type of consciousness um, mm -hmm. along with it. So, um, but yeah, I could share something. Um, let me think. Um, on the one hand, I'm over the hill. On the other hand, my cup runneth over with skill. And I'm just trying to do Jehovah's will. Let the real know that it's real. This is self therapy and I'm the therapist. I'm one with the same intelligence that gave me this inheritance. So believe I'm a cherish this. I feel like a sage living in the age of Aquarius now. I'm trying to free the slaves like Harry and now and lyrics rain on them like the various clouds. You are now rocking with the best, sending you the opposite of stress, unconditional love, knowledge of self, confidence and rest. The only way not to get depressed. So know this, you exist not just in the flesh, it's my hypothesis, the only option is to just give love. And there I go with that again. It must be all that matters then. That's, that's great. Thank you. Thank you, you didn't just make that up, did you? No, 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 that's <laughs> something I wrote. No, I, that would have been really that. impressive if you did. <laughs> <laughs> I should have said, yeah, that would have really. <laughs> no, I wrote, I, wrote, I wrote that down for sure. That took some thought time. Yeah, that's great. I liked it. Thank um, you. And you actually have a... Um, a YouTube channel, don't you, where you have uh, a bunch of your, your hip hop music? Yeah, I do. I, I, um, I started that back actually while I was in law school. Uh, I started rapping when I was probably 30, 32 years old, you know, mm -hmm. and I just started putting up videos and the feedback started coming in, positive feedback. Mm -hmm. And, you know, 
I just kept putting them out, putting them out until I had that spiritual awakening uh, disappeared on everybody. Yeah. So if you like, I'll put a link to that on your about that page as well as to your regular website and stuff. That'll work. That'll work. That'll be good. Good. Yeah, I still, I still uh, do a little writing here and there. It's not as uh, consistent as I was before, but um, I only have one topic now, you know. <laughs> so, <laughs> You're a one-trick pony. Yeah, a one-trick pony now. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, you know, I mean, you could actually create a whole genre of uh, spiritual rap, spiritual hip-hop. I, mean, I suppose there is that sort of, but you could kind of like make a greater emphasis on it and specialize in it. You know, uh, at this at this point, I'm like open to whatever happens. Like, I have to really be the process of writing uh, hip hop music is, I guess, like any other art. You have to, I have to really uh, focus on what I'm doing, and uh, it's it's not like a, a you know, a quick thing. So yeah, yeah, you have to kind of get that momentum going. And yeah, 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 exactly. I have to, especially if I haven't done it in a while, you know, right. then I have to dust off the cobwebs and it takes so much effort yeah. to just create this one little piece of a song, <laughs> you know, yeah. I just don't, I don't know, but I, I like doing it every now and then. That's great. Yeah. All right. So I sort of feel like we're kind of wrapping up here. Um, is there anything else that comes to mind that you'd like to tell people I have the chance? Um, not, I don't have anything, uh, not really. Um, I just, you know, you know, I just hope, you know, I don't know. There's different people, people watch these for different reasons, right? Everybody's in a different phase. I remember when I used to watch, um, you know, I was kind of, you know, just trying to f find, uh, something that could help speed up my uh you know my enlightenment basically or speed up the process of feeling like i had to seek so uh you know so hard and um you know i just would you know i just hope that whoever's watching um you know got whatever they are looking for but also i want to encourage everyone to you know go within you know be still um, the silence can tell you more than any interview or any book. The silence is the um, is so counterintuitive to listen to the silence. And, and, you know, it just seems like there's nothing there. So why would you go there? You know, and it's like sitting in the stillness sometimes is like staring at the sun. You know, you know, it gets so bright sometimes you have to look away. But I would just encourage, I would, I would encourage people to just stay, you know, stay and don't, uh, you know, and try to, try to, uh, you know, be objective, uh, you know, as you're talking to yourself or you could feel yourself, um, you, you could feel a sense of trying to be still or you feel yourself trying to be more enlightened, you know, watch, watch all that movement because it's that uh, it's the watching of of that movement and that, you know, watch yourself, um, you know, watch your ego like that's a very subtle arrogance that kind of flies under the radar. It's very arrogant to think that you could figure enlightenment out, you know, but it's something that we all go through. So I would say, you know, watch that arrogance. Notice how the mind or the ego thinks that it's going to eventually figure this out one day, you know, and don't judge it. I mean, you know, or if you do judge it, notice the judging, you know, and then at some point it's like, um, you know, remember those posters you used to stare at, you could stare at them for a long time. It just looks like a bunch of colors. And then if you stare at it for a while, you know, eventually the 3d image would appear, you right. know? And I think, uh, you know, sometimes, it's like that, you know, you kind of just got to sit and just, you know, constantly get in a habit of paying attention to what your mind is up to, you know, and it kind of that activity in itself kind of, uh, you know, does the trick and there, the effort will kind of subside and the sense of the sense of thinking that you could figure it out kind of subsides. 
and it's kind of like a next thing you know, um, uh, you're, you know, you're no longer seeking, you know, and, you know, I think that's the, you know, the biggest take home, I would say, to take out of this interview, um, you know, give up, you know, give up, you know, it won't happen. You give up, allow your ego to continue on the journey, but you give up, you know, you can't do it. Yeah. yeah. And there's a, there's a sort of a subtlety to that too, because it can, and it, and it can be misinterpreted to mean like, oh, well, might as well just sit on the couch and drink beer and watch television. Uh, but one can still be very much engaged in spiritual pursuit, but without the effort, you know, there can be, it can be more of a, a surrender than a, than an individual, you know, willful f force, force based kind of, um, effort. And, and that's when you, you really get somewhere, I think is, is when you, well, is that bumper sticker, let go and let God, you know? Yeah. And, um, I think also um, that, you know, that willful, forceful effort you spoke about is very important as well. And because, it's at, perhaps at a stage. Yeah, at a stage. You know, you have to, um, you have to, you have to realize that if you're going to, uh, that seeking is going to happen. You, tr you try not to seek is, you know, it's probably pretty useless because the ego wants to know and it thinks it's going to figure it out, you know. So um, I would say, you know, if you could boil it down to one word, it would be notice. Just notice because there's a lot going on um, on your behalf and as you, you know, there's a lot happening as though it is you and you are going along with it as though it is you. And a silent watching of that will reveal that there is, that is just, uh, uh, there's no, uh, there's no one in there. There's no individual, there's no person in there. There's just a sense, there's just a sense of someone being in there. And that's not a bad thing or a good thing, but to notice that, mm. you know, not, not because someone told you, because people are gonna try to point you there by using different words and different books and whatever. But for you to uh, pay attention and slowly but surely notice and not to, ex you know, I'm not, I would say don't expect that aha moment, but you can't choose whether or not you're going to expect that aha moment. Just notice that you're expecting that aha moment. You know, it's like uh, watching your own thoughts objectively is a practice. It's something that you have to practice and then it becomes self, uh, it becomes second nature. Mm -hmm. you, and then you, sh you realize, you know, beyond a shadow of a doubt, like, like Eckhart Tolle says that you are not your thinking. You could swallow that and, um, everything else will be kind of like the game, you know, you just play along with it, you know? Yeah, that's good. <clears throat> I th maybe another note we could end on is that what we both said earlier that, you know, in a sense, we're all beginners. And, um, and so the, I always have a bone to pick with these people that say, well, you're just, I'm done, and everybody else should just be done, and all that, because you're never done. I mean, you, you may have a sense of contentment, and you're resting in that, in that sense of contentment, and, uh, but there's no end to uh, discovery and kind of refinement of cl clarity and understanding and so on. I'm just, I just ne never met anyone whom I feel is done in that sense. And why would you want to be done? Yeah. What does that, what does that mean? You know, um, anyone who claims to be done is so in their ego it's like, you know, it's just like, how can, how can you be done? And then at the same time, n not, and there be the unknown, like, because the unknown is so vast, there's no way you could claim to be done. Now I could say that there's certain things that could be over. You could be past certain yeah. struggles, you know, in that sense. Yeah, you're done. But, um, I am, you know, as long as I'm experience, experiencing life through this, uh, what we 
call a body. Um, I look forward to the, uh, you know, the, the, the unknown of what's going to happen as far as my awareness and my, um, you know, you know, I think what it is, is like people are looking for that person who is so enlightened that they could, uh, you know, you know, follow, right. you know, and um, that is like a, a rock in the bush. You know, you throw a rock in the bush. If you want somebody to, if they're looking for you and they want to, ch and they're chasing you, throw a rock over there and they'll run over there. And I think that looking for a spiritual teacher, trying to find that ultimately enlightened person is definitely a, a, a rock in the bush. There are people who resonate with people more than others, but the universe will bring that person to you, into your life, you know? Um, a lot of this is just, I, I, you know, honestly, a lot of this kind of like um, filler. Uh, all the, it's just filler. Uh, the, what do you mean? The, um, because, you know, we use all these different concepts and words to talk about something that is so simple. Yeah. Muji, Muji puts it like this, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna definitely butcher this, but he says, um, you know, somebody's uh, uh, asking him how to get um, home, and he's like, well, you're here, and then, you know, he's like, no, I'm sorry, he, I really want to know, like, how do I get all the way home? I want to be home, home, and then he said, okay, well, since they want to go on a journey, you send them up, go down to this street, and then you turn right, and then you go down a couple of blocks, and you turn right, and you turn, you know, and then you turn right, and you come right, and you give them these, this, this path, so then, and you say, you, once you follow that path, and then you'll arrive back home, and they're like, perfect, thank you, and then they, <laughs> they set off on their journey, you know. And uh, I think that's what the, the directions that we give in that analogy is a lot like all these books and interviews and the spiritual teaching that we do, you know. Um, you know, in the, in the, during everybody's on their own journey and in the course of your journey, it may seem so important in, 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 at the time, but at some point, it, you look back and you're like, oh, that was just, you know, that was just, um, you know, I'm already at, I'm back where I thought I was, I'm here, where I was looking for, you know, this is what I was always um, trying to find. All I had to do is just, uh, when you stop seeking, you're enlightened, <laughs> you know, <laughs> when you stop seeking, you're enlightened. And that's why I say people who are not seeking, people who are like, for example, my father-in-law, he, he's a, uh, he's a Christian and he's, you know, he's over, he's up in the administration and he's very honest man. And he's, you know, he lives the life that, you know, I get to see him in his underwear, you know, I've seen him behind closed doors and he is very consistent in what he does. And, um, in my eyes, he's as enlightened as you get, you know what I mean? And you, you can't get any more enlightened than that. And he'll probably look at this video and, you know, or maybe he won't. And or if you talk to him about non-duality, he'll be like, uh, you know, I'll just pray for you, you know. <laughs> but um, who, who can be more enlightened? I can't I definitely can't say that I'm more enlightened than that guy. You know, um, it's just like um, everybody is seeking the we have this idea of what enlightenment means and um the ego will have you going after what that idea is and um if you knew ahead of time what it was maybe you wouldn't seek so hard mm -hmm. yeah you yeah. know there's a great quote from t.s Eliot. he said we shall not cease from exploration and the end of all our exploring will be to arrive where we started and know the place for the first time Absolutely. Absolutely. And then that's where experiencing really begins, you know, and I think that's why people want enlightenment so bad, you know, is because the end, when they hear stuff like that, they're like the ego kind of the imagination kind of gives them a sense of what that must be like, you know, and they're like, well, what I'm at, where I'm at right now is not that. So I have to go get it, you know, and I mean, it makes sense. It's the, you know, it makes sense. 
who I, I did the same thing, but all I, you know, you want to, as from, as a spiritual teacher, you want to figure out a creative way to help them to say, oh, really? This is it? Oh, well, then I could just carry on with life because that's ultimately what happened after I did all the crying and all the seeking and all the spiritual experiences and all the, you know, journeys and videos and books and all that. Ultimately, I arrived at this sober place of, you know, quiet um, security where I could now just enjoy all of the variety of life um, without looking through the lens of, you know, that egoic sense of lack or not being being not good enough or whatever, you know? Yeah. But, you know, you went through all that stuff and in a way you kind of arrived back to where you started, but you're a very different person now than you were. And so it's not like all that stuff amounted to a, a big waste of time. Um, you know, you've been transformed. So it, it really had its value. Um, so that was You're not that. having panic attacks at least. For, oh, now that, that's for sure, you know, <laughs> that's for sure. And also, I love my wife. My wife loves me back. Yeah, um, life has been really enriched. It's been f really enriched, you know. But, you know, if you take away, it's like um, someone who is just slapping them. If you just slap yourself over and over again, um, when you stop slapping yourself, it's going to feel really good. You know, it's going to be like... Uh, a, you know, really good. And I think that's just kind of how I was with the panic attacks and the egoic uh, identification, trying to make Chad, this Chad person into something. Um, um, once that subsided, or once I realized that that was just all a figment of my imagination, 100%, I mean, not holding back just a little bit so that I could still, um, communicate with others or to have of uh, my wife and my kids like to realize that even that is a part of my imagination i have to my kids have to participate you have to participate my wife has to participate in this uh dream of bodies otherwise if we all got still and we say okay let's not pay attention to our roles let's just be here now and let a silence, let silence be here. And let all roles and all conditioning fall away. And then I think um, you realize that there's no one, there's no person here. The person only appears when I start engaging in my egoic my mind movement. But when I'm not engaged in that, when my attention is not on my mind movement, there's no one in here. There's just spirit. There's just this. And if, you know, it's hard for the ego to wrap its mind around that everybody that you see is constantly thinking. So we've been so submerged in this dream or in the, in the thinking that we forget that there's a such thing as um, not being or not participating. And then the ego tells you, well, then if you're not participating, then, um, you know, that means you don't love your family or you, you know, you know, when you're not participating, my wife is not special. When I'm not participating, no one is special. There's no special my kid. One kid, my son is not any more special than anyone else's son. I have to participate in this egoic dream in order for me to say, uh, you know, that that kid is really good at basketball and he's going to be a superstar. And I'm not really as concerned about your kid becoming a superstar, you know, and to play in that dream and to uh, realize while you're in the dream, while, while you're playing in the dream that, uh, you know, it's still a dream. It doesn't make it any more real, but you could play in it. And it doesn't disappear uh, just because um, it's not real doesn't mean it's not here for your experiencing. And you can't get the experience of love and the experience of competition and all these different and, and, and stress and fear and joy and all the different tastes of experiencing that comes with participating in the dream. Yeah. But 
at the same time, just having a uh, something like this background, knowing this understanding or this sense that, um, you know, it's still kind of a dream. Yeah. It says in the Bhagavad Gita, established in yoga, perform action. So it doesn't say just sit and be in being. It says be in being, which is yoga, but perform action. And uh, Lord Krishna, who is supposed to be an avatar of God, you know, in, in that book says, what would happen to these worlds if I didn't constantly engage in action while remaining in my own nature? Um, you know, so it's like both and, you, you know, it's not, it's not just the silence or just the activity, but in the integration of the two together that yeah. makes life much more than it w otherwise would be. Well, I, I say like, we are so much a part of nature that um, just like if you just sit still, um, life move on, nature, everything will move on. If you just sit still and just look around you as you as if you could you know take your awareness outside of your body and just look it will continue to move on well even within yourself you could look at your own body and your own thoughts and your own experiences as a part of that movement it's just going to continue to do and uh for a long time i struggled with muji uh i remember the first time i heard muji say you are not the doer of your actions. And I just set that comment aside. I was like, uh, Muji's good, but he don't know what he's talking about right there. You know, <laughs> yeah. like he's really good, you know, but that he's a little off on that, you know, and I couldn't swallow that for a long time, but I wasn't, um, that's not a, that's not an intellectual, that's not for, that's not, he's not speaking to my ego when he said that. He's pointing to something that's beyond my ego. And I can't begin to understand what he's talking about until I sit still or not even sit still. Like you said, it's just about paying attention from the place of stillness to all of the movement that's carrying on. And don't separate yourself from that movement. Don't separate your own thought from all of the rest, from the, the leaves blowing in the wind. Your thought is just my movement is movement stillness is stillness if it's not stillness then it's movement and it's like zeros and one if you're zero then everything else is one you know and being able to realize that you are zero even while you're doing while you're working yeah or while you're washing dishes or whatever sure you i know? mean if you know yourself as that stillness then you have the very real sense that you are not the doer because Stillness doesn't do. Stillness is still, and yet doing goes on. So who's doing the doing? You know what? What's doing it? There's there are explanations for that, but that's that's a real experience. Right, and you don't have to believe it. You know, um, it's not a belief. It's not a belief thing. You could disbelieve it. In fact, sure. in fact, the ego doesn't believe it. An, an ego can't believe it. It's unbelievable. But it's not for the belief system. And it, I mean, you could watch disbelief in silence. You know, I could not, or I could be at, uh, you know, I could be adamant against Donald Trump, like in politics, like, oh, he is not a good president. You know, I could watch my uh, ego saying that and make, even make an argument to someone who's um, an advocate of Donald Trump, you know, but in the meantime, I see the, I watch, I'm watching myself objectively. I don't really have a stake in that argument. I just allow my ego to argue. You're not <laughs> you know? attached to it. No, but I do believe that he's not a good president. Yeah. He's not, he's not presidential, but you know, I don't, you know, it'll ha whatever happens, happens. Jimmy Fallon had a great thing on last night, which people can find on YouTube, where he had these little kids that were pretending that they were talking like Donald Trump, you know, saying, we are, we're going to build a wall, and it's going to be the best wall. Mexico is going to pay for it and all this stuff. It's just these little four or wow. five, five year olds. It's very funny. <laughs> Check it out on YouTube. <laughs> well, I'm just I'm pretty impressed with your invitation right there. <laughs> yeah. I'm not mad. That's good. Yeah. You know, just adamant. Being adamant about anything is just um, an opportunity to. Um, see yourself objectively like anything you feel strongly about is a perfect opportunity to uh watch how i mean especially even about what you believe about advaita or non-duality or or uh you know or other religions or 
you know, maybe I, um, I was at, you know, I was reading when I was going through my spiritual awakening, I went through my, uh, uh, what is that phase called? I, I might have creative visualization. Uh -huh, right. Yeah, I went through that phase while I was creating, uh, you know, and it really threw me into a whirlwind of confusion, hmm. you know, because it didn't line up with what I was, uh, my internal truth. Uh, you know, trying to make something manifest, trying to create something in a certain way, you know, I was just like, that doesn't, that's, that can't, you know, and then I would try it and I'd fall into it. And then I'd be like, that doesn't, I'm confused. It was just that, that caused a lot of confusion, you know, and then I got really antagonistic against it, you know, you know, in my head, I was just adamant, like creative visualization. That is not the way to spiritual awakening. That is, that is like, uh, you know, it's basically um, a distraction. It's brainwashing in a way, you know, it's like the secret is another one. It's like, why, you know, these people who are, these are people who are capitalizing off of people who are seeking, uh, you know, true, trying to uh, come to a true spiritual awakening. And these people out here are capitalizing on that, their vulnerability by distracting them with trying to manifest something when they yeah, should be trivializing and yeah. uh but you know i mean the key thing here if we want to quote another bible verse is seek ye first the kingdom of heaven and all else should be added unto thee and that's the part that the secret leaves out is actually get us seek ye the kingdom of heaven get established there and then things will be added unto you but they'll they'll they won't necessarily be pearl necklaces and and mercedes they'll be the things you actually need they'll come more easily if you're grounded in in that deep state yeah, and, and the thing is, if you have that, if you have that Bible verse, then why do you need any other Bible verse? <laughs> yeah, that's why, a good one. Do, why do you need any other saying? Uh, also, another one is be still and know that I am God. You that's know, it's one. like, okay, well, that pretty much uh, sums it up. You know, everything else is like directions around the corner back to home, you know. <laughs> You know, uh, you know, just be still or seek ye first the kingdom of God. And then, um, you know, uh, but, you know, I, I mean, I said that to say um, now I'm I'm not even I don't even I'm not adamant against creative visualization. You know, yeah. you know, it's a tool. It's a tool. Yes, yes, it's a tool. Um, and who, who am I to, you know, if someone's into that, you know, obviously, it, you know, it has some value. It's here, so it's from God. <laughs> also, a lot of these things can be stages for people. Like, they might do that for a while, and then after a while, they might get kind of dissatisfied and think, well, that was interesting, but what, what's next? What more is there? You know, what, could there be a deeper teaching? And, and they might not have even asked that question if they hadn't gone through the creative visualization thing. Yeah, I mean, I think that's what happened with me. It's like I was just trying to gobble up everything, everything, any remote, uh, remotely... Uh, you know, related to uh, spirituality. And um, I had to see that, um, you know, there was a lot, there's a lot of, uh, I guess, for lack of a better word, it's just a lot of distractions um, out there. But like you said, how, how would you have come to the conclusion that everything, what conclude the conclusion I came to ultimately, and this I would attribute a lot to a, reading a Course in Miracles over and over again is that if you if if every all concepts were math and you added them all up, they would all lead to a, beyond concepts to enlightenment. You have to be able to, you know, you have to read law and you have to read, uh, you know, whatever you're into. If you're into math, then go all the way into math. Learn the the deepest math. And if you keep going, eventually that will probably lead you to the same thing that if you go, if you read A Course in Miracles over and over again, mm -hmm. and all the, I mean, it's the combination of all these together and this, that intense seeking that, you know, you start to get a bird's eye view of all of the concepts and then you can set all concepts aside, you know, like uh, um, they all add up to truth basically. Yeah, that's interesting. Kind of as you said that the image came to mind that, you know, all spokes on the wheel lead to the hub. You know, you take any spoke, follow it down, you get to the hub. Yeah, if you do it with if any any spoke you take with honesty and humility, 
um, well, I guess it's like it, it, it seems to draw you toward like uh, another great analogy that Muji says and is that, you know, it's like a bathtub and, you know, after you get out of the bath and it has the debris from your dirty self in there and the, the dirt right next to the hole is just going down fast. Those are the people who are getting sucked in. And, but the dirt back in the back of the back t- bathtub, it kind of seems like it's just kind of floating there. But, but it's, it's slowly but surely making its way uh, down that into that hole, you know. And if you're here, if you're in the back of the bathtub, the natural tendency is... I guess, to try to be in that hole, closer to that hole. And I think it's just kind of happening. And in the meantime, you'll seek and try to do everything you can to make it happen faster. But it's not necessary. If you do it, you do it. If you don't, you don't. You're getting pulled toward the hole, uh, whether you want to or not. And I think I uh, that is a... You cannot uh, fully let go and feel like, oh... I've, I'm done seeking until you come to the realization that something else is doing this. Yeah. As long as you're depending on your own ego or your own abilities, then uh, you're going to be, uh, you know, it's just going to see, it's, it's going to, that has to wear itself out. Yeah. That's- and when you come to that realization, then it's like, let thy will be done. You know, here I am. What would you like to do with me? I will be done, whatever it is, you yeah. know, and I, I'm at your service. I'm at, I'm at your service. And, and by the way, uh, it's like, I tell a story, I told a story at Sasan one night. It's like one of my daughters, um, when she was little, whenever I would leave the house, she would cry like, no, daddy, I want to go or don't leave, don't leave. And I'd be like, honey, um, I have to go, whatever it is, I have to go, you know? So I, I'd give her a kiss and I'd give her to her mom and she'd cry and then I'd leave, right? And then my other daughter, um, uh, you know, she would do exactly the opposite. Like when it was time for me to go, oh, honey, I got to go to work. She would go find my keys. Here, dad, <laughs> you know, here's your keys, you know? And then i say, oh, thank you, honey. I'd give her the kiss. I'd give her a kiss and head out. Um, there, there are two different approaches but ultimately, the same thing happened. I had to go. You know what I mean? So you could be the person who's fighting and scratching and saying, no, don't leave. Or you could just be the type that says, OK, thy will be done, you know, because yeah. thy will is going to be done regardless. You know, right. thy will is going to be done, you know, and um, that is a major uh, that is a major aha moment. Like, oh, OK, well, I guess it doesn't make any sense to me to do all this resisting or uh and it's also like okay well you take what you get you get what you get and it's not gonna always be pleasant it's not gonna always be happy times or you know you just get what you get you know yeah yeah byron katie is always fond of saying that you know if you fight against reality you're always gonna lose you know oh you're always gonna lose you're always gonna lose and fight same same is true for uh fighting against stress or fighting against uh you know, any other emotion that you, or psychological state that you don't want. You know, if you fight against it, you know, you can fight against it, but you're going to experience these things, you know, Mm -hmm. and it's just a part of it. You didn't take another five-hour energy this morning, did you? No, actually, I'm going to take a nap. I'm going to take a good nap after this uh, interview. You're doing pretty good for somebody who was up till God knows (laughs) how late (laughs) driving an Uber car. Yeah, yeah, I was excited. I was excited to talk to you. Really, it was like, um, you know, it was it's, it's a dream. Well, actually, you know, it's just like in this non-dual world, we're in our own. We're kind of in our own sub world, you know. And the things that the people that we look up to and admire are different than the people that the regular people look up to and admire, you know. So when I watch uh, uh, Boot at the Gas Pump interviews, you know, I'm always kind of. Uh, watching the questions that you ask and if I anytime I have a sense of uh, that doesn't seem right you'll all it seems like you always had that same sense and you know you <laughs> ask a question like okay you know and it's a very honest approach to um, um, interviewing and I'll just you know excited about doing I've been talking about it to my family although they could care less you know yeah. um, 
I'm just I'm happy to be here. You know. That's great. Well, I appreciate it. Um, oh, let me just ask you. I know you do the local satsangs uh, there in Sacramento. Do you um, do any like Skype sessions with people or anything like that? I have. Um, you know, all my spiritual teaching has really tapered off okay. a lot. You know. Um, other than uh, satsang, I'm not, I mean, every now and then, you know, I still have my website there. So people contact me and I'll do a Skype session or um, I'll, you know, I have one-on-one -on -one meetings. So if somebody contacted you, you would do it? Oh yeah, sure. Yeah, okay. And obviously you're entitled to charge some reasonable fee to cover your time. No, you're a busy guy. Um, so I just wanted to throw that out there in case, because people sometimes wonder, oh, I like this guy. How can I follow up? What can I do? You know, and they, but they might live in England or someplace, and so the, you, they, there's that opportunity if they're interested. Oh yeah, absolutely, and you know, I love it. I love uh, this is like my, uh, it's like a hobby, a passion of mine. You know, to continue to talk about it, but I also uh, get a kick out of talking to people who are honestly, honestly uh, in that. Uh, you know, I guess the valley of the shadow of death, you know, really there. They're not trying to, they don't have any ulterior motives, but they're really just trying to be done, you know, and I, I, I like um, holding, uh, talking, conversations with those people. Great. Okay. Well, thanks. Um, this has really been good. We've, <laughs> it's been about 45 minutes since I was about to conclude, but we just kept going because it, yeah, you know, this is, we both love this stuff. Yeah, it's good. It's a good topic. It's a fun topic. Yeah. So let me make a few wrap up points. Um, okay. I've been speaking with Chadwick Johnson. Everybody realizes that if they've gotten this far. And uh, as always, I will link to his website and anything else he wants me to link to from his page on batcap.com. You can get in touch with him through that if you want. Um, this interview is part of an ongoing series, and if you go to the website you'll and poke around through the menus, you'll see the, the previous ones categorized in various ways. You'll see a place to sign up to be notified by email each time there's a new one. Uh, there's the PayPal button I mentioned in the beginning. Uh, there's an audio podcast of this that you can sign up for and subscribe to it on iTunes or Stitcher or whatever, and you know, listen while you're commuting or whatever. Um, there's even like things of like a ringtone and. Uh, for your phone if you want with the bath gap theme song so if you explore all the menu, all the menus you'll find some fun stuff um i mentioned the, like last week that i was going to interview byron katie the next time i think but then that that got postponed a couple of times so um it's it's coming up if a lot of people know about byron katie and byron katie and we're interested in that but keep an eye on the upcoming interviews menu and <clears throat> you'll see where that's gonna when that's gonna be so, until next time, thanks for listening or watching. Uh, thank you again, Chad. It was a lot of fun. Yeah, it was very, it was very fun. I, I appreciate you allowing me to uh, participate in this experience. Yeah, it's really great. I think was... people will enjoy this. And uh, as usually, it's kind of a marathon. I usually go over two hours, but you know, some people like that. And if they don't, they can always just get a taste and then go on to the next thing. Yeah, you can fast forward, <laughs> skip through it, whatever you want to do. Yeah. All right, thanks. Uh, I'll talk to you later. All right, thank you, man. Bye-bye.